This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Story Beat episodes are available at storybeat.net and on all major podcast apps and platforms. If you like this episode, please take a moment to leave us a rating or review. And please subscribe to Story Beat wherever you listen to podcasts. My guest today, the extraordinary comedy writer Janice Hirsch got her start in the business by talking her way into a job on the National Lampoon show called Lemmings, which starred the then unknown John Belushi, Christopher Guest, and Chevy Chase, among others. She subsequently worked at the National Lampoon magazine back, as she says, when it was funny. She's also contributed to several books of humor, as well as writing for various publications, including both the New York Times and a much heralded parody of it called The Not the New York Times, which was the brainchild of Tony Hendra, Christopher Surf, and George Plimpton. Janice's first TV writing job was on a show called Love, Sydney. She went on to be a writer and producer on more than 25 different series, including such shows as Square Pegs, It's Gary Shandling Show, The Nanny, Murphy Brown, Frasier, and Will and & Grace. And she wrote her first TV pilot under the tutelage of no less than the legendary producer Norman Lear. Janice has rewritten several feature films, including Girls Just Want to Have Fun, and has added material to various stage shows, including the musical Hairspray. She wrote the book for the musical Some Kind of Wonderful, directed by Tony winner John Rando. She also contributes special material for Bette Midler's tours and shows. Janice has also written a memoir that is currently being read by publishers, and she's developing a limited series with Perry Gilpin and Suzanne Todd. Having had polio as a child, Janice works tirelessly to see the inclusion of disabled artists in all aspects of the TV and film industry. She's honored to have multiple Media Access Awards, a Humanitas Award, and the Pillar of Leadership Award by the National Honor Society, Omicron Delta Kappa. So for those reasons, and many more, I'm deeply honored to welcome the exceptionally talented writer-producer Janice Hirsch to Storybeat today. Janice, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, I, I, I've got to edit that bio because it's a, it really is something that only a mother could love. So. <laughs> well, uh, uh, occasionally people call me a mother, but that's for other reasons. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so, all right, let's go all the way back to your beginning. What were your earliest inspirations and influences and how did you wind up in comedy of all things? Um, I used to love watching after school, I was allowed to watch before dinner um, the variety shows that were on back in the day, you know, Merv Griffin show, stuff like that. And those stand-up comics and those women, and that was Renee Taylor, who I later worked with on The Nanny. She played right. grand grandmother. And, God, it was Toadie Fields, Lily Tomlin. So Mom, was, Moms Mabley, you go back to Moms that? Moms Mabley, all of those women. And I just, I would laugh so hard. And my mother would be in the kitchen cooking dinner and saying, Stop laughing that hard. Nobody is that funny. And I went, I really think they are. And so that, that was a real early influence uh, on me. And then as far as, I, you know, I, I read, but I didn't love, you know, I read the stupid kids books, you know, about nurses and stuff. But the day I read Auntie Mame and, and laughed out loud and went, oh, you can write things. You don't have to say them out loud and they can still be funny. That was a big light bulb for me too. That was a bit of a, a revelation, huh? That you could actually write it down. I had no idea. I had no idea because, you know, the printed word that I had was, you know, and, and having had polio, I, you know, every librarian that I, school librarian gave me a book on Franklin Delano Roosevelt, our most inspirational president. And I was so bored. <laughs> and then I read something funny and went, oh, all right, good. I get it. So did you start writing? What, what age were you? Were you seven, eight, ten? What were you? Yeah, I was little and I was only writing stupid stuff, you know, funny cards for my mother. I was writing little stupid things, you know, quizzes I would do for friends and stuff, but nothing really. Columns in the school newspaper, but nothing 
that made me think, I didn't even know writing was a profession. Well, I didn't know you could do that. I think most people have no idea writing's a profession. In fact, I think there are a lot of people that think it's, how, how could you possibly be a writer ever? You know? Uh, it, it was, you know, when we would have career day and we'd have to choose, I would go like foreign correspondent because I knew the words would shut people up enough when if you said they said what do you want to be I'd say foreign correspondent and then they never asked me a question and I didn't know any of the answers anyway so I'm glad they didn't ask me a question. So you were sort of writing all along but you didn't know you were going to be a writer it wasn't something you set out to do. No and, and in college I was a theater major which I loved and uh, uh, but again, I thought, oh, I'll direct or I'll stage manage. And, and I loved doing those things on a college level. You know, I never you, saw myself as a director. You were at college in Winter Park, Florida, weren't you? At yes, Rollins. I was in Winter Park, Florida, Rollins College. Yeah, so I've spent a little time in Orlando. I spent a year down there. So I understand oh, that I'm whole sorry. area. Yes, me, oh, okay. me too. But that's another yeah. story again. Yeah, okay. <laughs> were you always funny? I know you were admiring funny women on TV. But were you yourself like a class clown? Did you always make quips? Did people know you were funny? Well, I, if you ask me, I go, no, nah, I was regular, but I know that in junior English in high school, my desk was in the hallway. My teacher would make me come in and then schlep my desk into the hallway outside the door. Why? And then when I had, and then when I raised my hand, I had to like curve my arm around <laughs> so that she could see that I had something to say. Cause I guess I did, I, I guess I did disrupt you, with you my with whatever I was talking about. You had a sharp tongue as a young person, didn't you? Well, I, you know, my mother swears I made that teacher retire. She said, you know, she really <laughs> couldn't take it after your year. But I just thought I was having fun with my friends. That's all. All right, so the old line, the old saw is, dying is easy, comedy is hard. And I know it's almost impossible to define, but can you comment? Do you know what, for you, makes comedy so difficult to do well? What is it about it? Well, first, I, I, uh, I can speak first of all about television. That people, if, if I meet people in, at a party or at some social situation and they say, uh, you know, I t they find out that I'm a comedy writer, they say to me, oh my God, you should come to my office. My dental practice is a sitcom waiting to be written. <laughs> and what I want to say to them is, Here's a pen, here's a piece <laughs> of paper. You write it if it's so funny. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't say, somebody says to me, I'm a brain surgeon, I don't go, oh, what I, you know what? I could, I, I think I could really be a good brain surgeon. Everybody in my family says I'm the best brain surgeon they've ever met. I'd be a great brain surgeon. You know, people who, you know, or they say to me, be funny. Uh -huh. I'm not gonna be funny. But I think that comedy isn't, is only hard when you try. It, it's I mean, only it's hard when you, you try. Only hard if, if you have to sweat it out. I mean, and listen, there are times when I've been doing television shows and you have a lousy run through and you have to rewrite everything that night. Mm -hmm. And you really do have to just say, oh, I have to, you know, it can't come from this place of joy within me. I, it, this is a job. Because, but I think that that's a muscle. I think that writing comedy is a muscle that it takes time to develop. But just, Comedy itself is hard because people, I think, take themselves very seriously. Mm -hmm. I think people are loath to make fun of themselves or see themselves as the butt of a joke. You know, uh, I, I think that comedy is hard if you're trying to write for something that you don't really love. I've had trouble writing. I had, listen, Will and Grace, arguably one of the best shows on television in the history sure. of comedy. Absolutely. I had trouble writing it because I didn't have something, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't as connected. I loved watching it, but I wasn't connected enough to the characters, what they wanted to be able to see funny through them. I could write for family sitcoms. I could write for, Mur you know, my wife and kids, or I could write for Murphy Brown because she was a, a, a woman who wanted stuff, or I could write for Square, uh, square Pegs because they were nerdy teens. I, I could feel that I just didn't have the ability, and this is my fault, that I did not have the ability to access that part of me. 
and and that was a that was a regret. I made a career move when I took the job on Will and Grace. I didn't make I, I didn't normally I take a job because I think I can really write this or you know I can get it and this is my you know I can find something in it that'll that'll be funny. So it sounds like you have to have a connection to the characters. It's all about the characters. It you have to. You just have to, you know. Um, I I have a, 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 the fact that I'm a Jew, like Fran Drescher, that helped. But the fact that I have a mother, I had a mother and a grandmother, and, and that kind of thing, I get it. You know, I get it. I, I I get those kind of shows. I mean, I written funny stuff for a show called Double Trouble, which was about twins. But I got that they were kids wanting something. Mm -hmm. I, I knew what they wanted, you know? So it, it, with Will and Grace, was it that it was a, 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 a setup, the situation itself, that was a little bit outside of your, your bubble of understanding? Is that what it was? Well, I think part of it was that I came on the last year and mm. the people who were writing it had been on it forever. So they knew those characters. Sure. And I certainly identified with the characters. And I could write funny stuff for them, but I wasn't as facile and I wasn't as sharp and as helpful to the show as I've been on other shows because I didn't, you know, I, at that point, I don't know. I just didn't connect it, uh, on that on that visceral level. And that, that was my shortcoming. All right. So I think that that's very valuable for the uh, our listeners to understand is that there has to be some kind of a, a thread of connection and if you don't have it, it's really hard to write comedy. Right. I mean, I could write for my wife and kids for, for a, 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 you know, a black family because it was a family, mm -hmm. you know, and it was, I, and I got it. I, I get the family dynamic. Sure. All uh -huh. right. So, so let's talk about sitcom writing in general, which is what you've spent your career yeah. mainly doing. Um, for those who have no idea what working on a sitcom is like, and you've obviously worked, you already mentioned a bunch of, you know, incredible ones, Frasier, Will and Grace, Murphy Brown, and so on. Um, can you describe what a typical day is like? And you don't need to go through the whole day, just in general, is it writing in a room by yourself or is it writing around a table, which I know that it is, but I'm just want to hear from you as to your perspective on what working on a sitcom is like. Working on a sitcom, first of all, can be the most fun you'll ever have in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I would come home and we all would talk about this where you feel so guilty when your spouse or whoever says, how was your day? You can't say, I laughed so hard for so long that I actually think I extended my life. You can't say that. You go, oh, it's fun, you know, but you can't because it can be so great because the ideal working experience is you're on a show with half a dozen or more writers whom you respect with senses of humor that you respect and you want to make them laugh and they want to make you laugh. I just did a, I, I just did a, 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 I had a Zoom experience in May on a, uh, two week gig on a pilot. It's going to be an HBO max series. It was called hacks then, but I, I it's, I'm sure it's changed. It's with, um, it's Gene smart playing a Joan rivers type character. Oh, wow. Okay. And the, and the, the writer producers director who people I genuinely admired, Paul W Downs, um, Lucia and yellow, who's also directed it. And they also did rough night, which is one of my favorite funny movies. And, and then Jen Statsky and the, and the writers they had assembled were from The Good Place, were from uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, really good, smart shows. And I was just on for two weeks because I was the old lady whisperer, basically. You know, they were writing, it was about a woman who got canceled, a young, a 20-ish year old writer who got canceled um, for doing some assholey thing. And she gets a job working in Vegas for a Joan Rivers type played by Gene Smart. Right. And they hadn't even known about Joan Rivers beyond the red carpet lady until they watched the documentary. Uh -huh. And so because I had worked with Bette Midler and I, you know, had been around those people and Rita Rudner and all that stuff. So I, we had a ball and these people, it was a joy because they were so funny that I wanted to be at the top of my game and they were so inclusive. And that I wanted to be on top of my game and they wanted to be on top of their game. And we all, and I loved what the show was and what it was saying and all that stuff. 
So that was a truly wonderful experience. And then in those cases, you sit down and you either, the, the people in charge, the powers that be, have either already started to work out what the season arc is going to be, or you work that out together. You start talking about, here's where our characters are going to start. Here's where they're going to stop. Right. And, and I think that, in retrospect, was probably part of the Will and Grace, my Will and Grace issue, because they already had that blocked out, and I wasn't a part of that. So it, it was just harder. Anyway. So you, so you were mostly right On Will and Grace, you were right, mostly a joke writer is what you were doing. Yeah. Um, more, but more than creating story. You were just sort of pumping jokes. Well, in. and they were creating story, but they were creating story from things that they had been talking about for eight years or seven years. Right, sure. So, uh, but on this show or on other sitcoms, you're coming in, like on Frasier, we used to come in and they'd say, we would just talk about the most embarrassing things that ever happened. Like one kid went to Boy Scout camp and his mother made him take a suitcase instead of a backpack. <laughs> and that was such a Frasier Nilesy thing to do, you know? Sure. I mean, yeah. you, you talk about the bad dates. You talk about, I, when I got the job on, um, on uh, Wife and Kids because um, I was talking, I met with Damon Wayans. I'd flown to New York to meet with Damon and Don Rio, the coup was creating it with him and I'd worked with him before. And I said, okay, here's, here's what happened the other night with my husband. Our son was at that point, Charlie was, you know, six months old, four months old or something. And Larry was, I think my kids were over. So Larry was playing cards with them and he had Charlie on his lap and he shuffled the deck and the noise that the deck makes shuffling a made our son laugh. And it was the first time he had a belly laugh. I mean, it was just, you know, it was a thousand angels singing. So I quick grabbed the video camera, which in those days it was a video camera. And I took a video of him and Larry would do it and Charlie would laugh and laugh and it was golden. So everybody goes to bed and Larry and I are in, in our room and I said, let's, we have to watch that video again. It's just the, the most wonderful thing. So we watched it and Larry said, we have to erase it. And I said, what are you talking about? This is the first time our son laughed. We can't erase it. He said, no, look, you can see my balls hanging out of my shorts. <laughs> And I went, nobody's going to notice. And he said, yeah, they are. And I said, well, I didn't notice. And he said, not the first time, but you will notice. And, and so he had to erase it. And of course, we did it the next day. And he found the cards. And Charlie just went, eh. But I told that story to Damon. And Damon said, you're hired. Because that was the kind of real life stuff. You know, you don't want to make up stuff. I don't, mm -hmm. I've never had a funny neighbor. I've written funny neighbors, you know, Julia Louis-Dreyfus was a funny neighbor on a show I did. You know, you'd like to write the funny neighbor, but nobody has somebody who rings the doorbell or walks in and is Kramer or is Urkel or is Lenny and Squiggy or whoever. Right. But that kind of story that my husband's balls were hanging out of his shorts, <laughs> that was enough of a story. All right, so, so clearly you're having a ball coming to work and sitting around a table yakking it up and making jokes with lots of really smart, funny, talented people. Yeah. When do you write a script? Well, what we do is first you, you talk about the story. You talk about a story area. If you know where you're headed in the arc of the season, like this season is going to take us through where their kids move back home, for instance, you know, so, something like that. And you go, oh, okay. So that's the arc. And then you start writing, you start pitching stories that are, if it's a family thing, husband and wife stories, if it's a workplace thing, workplace stories, friend story, you know, whatever, that will just move the ball a little bit without, as we used to say, hanging a lantern on it. Like when the, when the, um, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but we just watched uh, that wonderful series, Queen's Gambit. Oh, and the first time the mother coughs, you go, uh-oh. You know, that's hanging a lantern on that situation. Sure. So, so you talk about the stories then. What would happen? And I read this as a genius thing that um, uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who did uh, 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 South Park, yes. what they said, this is how they structure it. Instead of saying this happens and then this happens, they say this happens, but then this happens. So it's not, the next thing that happens isn't inevitable. The next thing that happens is, is a rug getting pulled out from under you. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is a really helpful way to develop a story. And, but that but still has to be logical within the context of the story. Of course. You, you don't say that, you know, a, and then a meteor strikes. You don't do that. But if you think, you know, uh, your, your parents give you a pep talk of how to talk to the cute girl at school, and then the next day, the cute girl at school 
instead of saying she, you talk to her, you say, well, then she comes out as as a a a, a they them that person, and you know she's she's going to be gender gender neutral. I don't know what the story is, but it's you got to shake it up a little bit. Right. You come up with that, and we do it. You normally do it on on a board or on like when we do it on Zoom. There there are millions of programs you can do what shared whiteboard, and then the writer whose idea it was or who's up next takes that outline, takes it and makes it into an outline. Then the outline gets shared with everybody. You write up the outline, then the outline gets shared with everybody. And then you work on the outline until the outline is fine. Because outline is the most important thing a writer can do. Why? Explain why. Because you got to know where you're going. It's a pain in the ass and every, nobody likes doing an outline. I mean, I sort of like it now, but young writers, I oh, know I just want, I'm going to write, you know, because you read those stories. I I just sat down and I wrote a whole script in a night. Well, I bet it's not that great. You got to outline it because you got to know where the problems are. Mm-hmm. You got to know, because otherwise you're going to paint yourself into a corner. You, you have to outline it so that you can follow every character so that you can be true to every character so that you can follow the plot because you don't want it when you're writing a script, what you want to do then is type and look for jokes if you're writing a sitcom and find right. new jokes and new funny ways of saying whatever it is you said in the outline. Right. You don't want to have to be saying, oh my God, now she's at the hardware store. I didn't know, what am I going to do? How am I going to get her out of here? So the more you know your, the whole outline of the story, and an outline can be, an outline can, for a 40-page script or a 35-page script can be 25 pages long. Mm-hmm. I mean, Joe Keenan, who is arguably one of the best sitcom writers there is, from Frasier, he would write such detailed outlines that he created an algorithm where he could just program it and it would turn that into a basic script. <laughs> and then he would work on it from there. I mean, it wasn't by any means done, but... He had enough dialogue and enough stage direction and enough so that he knew exactly where he was going. So he, in the outline, he already had some jokes and funny stuff already plugged Whatever in. Whatever you can find, you put in. You can find a joke, put it in. You can always beat it. You can always write a better one. Sure. You know, I, 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 another thing that, that Don Rio, my, my favorite mentor, everything, said is never fight for a joke or a story point unless you think it's the last joke or story point you're ever going to write. Wow. And it's true. You know, you, the, the rookie mistake is you get in a room with a, with a writer and you go, okay, this joke, let's, let's see if we can beat it. And the writer goes, no, 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 it's, it's really good. Well, it is good, but let's see if we can do even better. And you know what? When we hear it read, if it sucks, we can go back to your joke. Usually it's no backsies. That's a big thing in a room. You don't go back. You know, the writers who go, no, no, no. But what I meant was, no, just let it go. Mm-hmm. Kiss it goodbye. Send it off like one of those mylar balloons that's going to go in the ocean and choke a dolphin. Send it away. <laughs> let it float away from you and come up with something new. You can always beat it. A joke that could choke a dolphin. Well, that just... <laughs> to me i don't know right so so what happens i assume you've over time seen um writers who can't quite handle that that they think that their work is superior in some way i I, have you seen writers fail because of that and have you seen writers overcome that and succeed well it depends if the writer is the showrunner then the show then that then their word is gospel you know and when the showrunner writes it you don't say a word i had an experience on a show, I don't want to name the show. Sure. Um, where I wrote the draft, and it was going to be the first draft, the first script that we read that season. It was a big show, and and I wrote it, and then the showrunner decided to rewrite it. Right. And so the showrunner rewrote it, and that was the version that went to the table. And after the read, the star of the show tore me a new one in front of everybody. Lovely. And just said. You clearly don't understand what the show is about. You clearly don't understand my character. You cl- I mean, it wasn't screaming. It was just, and that the screaming almost would have been better. It was sure. just so calm and surgical. And I just had to stand there and take it because I couldn't say, but the show ran and me around me. I couldn't do that because mm-hmm. that wasn't, you know, the sh- if the showrunner didn't pipe up, I wasn't going to pipe up. You know, the showrunner could have fallen on the sword, but didn't. No, so, they threw you under the bus. Well, and every, you know, and it was really 
chilling. And then what happened later is that the star, who was also the one of the executive producers, the star's assistant, had read my earlier draft because it had gone around to, you know, you, you, you circulate an early draft so that the costumers know what to get, what to pull, and the prop people know what to pull, and the set people. Right. And the assistant had seen my earlier draft and gave it to the star. And the star read it. And that star called me up and apologized. Wow. Then the star took it up with the executive producer and whatever. Everything went after that. And I didn't say a word. Nobody said a word. But that star was my, my best friend from then on. But <laughs> well, did that hurt your relationship with the, with the exec? No, not at all. Because the exec just went on you know, and moved on. And I actually really like this exec and a, a terrific writer and a very successful person. But there are other execs who, you know, there are shows where when you gang write a show, I mean, you'll see Chuck Lorre is the only person that the Writers Guild allows to, awards more than two credits. Usually you can get a story credit and then you can get a written by with two people. And I'm on the arbitration panel. I'm an adjudicator. So I, I know this. you don't get a lot of credit. But on Chuck Lorre shows, which is Big Bang and Sheldon, Young Sheldon and Mom and everything, you know, terrific writer. But there are always three or four credits in the story and three or four credits in the writing because they write everything in the room. Oh, they and write everything. No, nobody goes off and writes a script to come in. What, I've never been on his show, but that's what I'm told, that nobody goes off. Because what happens on a normal show is after your outline is approved, then you go off and you write it. And then you come back and it goes through the mill. Everybody gets their greasy mitts on it. Sure. You, you, wrote, you get the credit because you wrote the first draft. That's the hardest part is the blank page. It's easy to rewrite. It's hard to write. Sure. Okay. So you, you said something that I've not had anybody discuss on the show before, um, and that's arbitration and adjudication of, of work. Can you explain that process for the listeners? What happens with a script that goes through an arbitration process? Well, what happens is the, um, when a script is uh, shot, written and shot, then the producers give, the, give a credit. Um, this doesn't happen. It happens a lot on pilots, and it happens a lot on miniseries, in my experience. And on I, features. I, and on features. I don't really arbitrate a lot of features. I arbitrate mostly TV. television. Sure, sure. But the producer will give a credit. And then somebody gets to say, I object. I need, I should get the credit. What the producer will often do is they'll give the credit to either the first writer, because the Writers Guild, you always want to give the first writer credit. But if that writer has been so substantially rewritten mm -hmm. by, you know, you, you only call, you never know names. It's writers A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It goes on and on. And then what happens is a panel reads every single version of the script. Every draft. Every draft. Again, not knowing who's who. And then the final version. And then they see what, what whether the final writer, whether the first writer should get credit, who should get credit with the first writer. Was the first writer completely thrown out? And some of them are, I mean, there was one I did that was just, I mean, people bring in lawyers. They, they are, it's, it can be devastating. It can well, there's, be people, well people there's a lot of money and reputation wow. involved, isn't there? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of money in getting created by credit and developed by credit. And I started doing it when I lost credit on Girls Just Want to Have Fun. When I did a page one rewrite, never even seeing the original script, and I lost credit because they said it was originally written as a drama about a girl who wanted to be in a dance contest and her father said no. And it was a comedy about a girl who wanted to be in a dance contest. So... I lost credit and I was given a, a production credit, which was lovely. But I said, you know what? I have to be on the committee from now on because I want to be a part of this process. I can't just complain about it. Mm -hmm. So I've been on this process since 1985 or six. Wow. Yeah, since, since Girls Just Want to Have Fun. So you've read a lot of drafts of a lot of things. I've read a lot. The best was when somebody arbitrated a tales of the, true tales of the FBI. So it was a real story. <laughs> and he said, no, I wrote it. No, I wrote it. It was like, it really happened, guys. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but there are series where every, there, there was a mini series. Oh, God, I can't remember what it was. Based on the Korean snowfall. Was that it, snowfall? Oh, you got me. I, I have no, no idea. I, I don't know. Anyway, every single episode, 
And so happily, I've graduated where instead of having to read every episode, I just talked to the three writers, the three anonymous writers, and discuss what they found and see if we can't come up with an equitable solution. But sometimes when, when you have panels and, and, and one writer comes in and just sobs the whole time, mm-hmm. or when lawyers come in and yell at you, you know, it's, it's hard. Oh, well, no doubt. If people t- it's very personal to people. It's very personal. Their blood is on that page. You know, they spilled their guts. Right. So all right, let's go back a half step to back in, in the room again. Um, you, you've never actually had a collaboration with a partner, right? You've never been a partnered writer. I, I've never, I've written episodes with partners. I wrote on Square Pegs, Andy Borowitz and I wrote a couple episodes together, you know, from the Borowitz it, Report. Yeah, the Borowitz Report. And uh, uh, on... Um, but you've never had a formal yeah. partnership no, over a... Lane. a you, no. You've always been a solo act, except where you're yeah. occasionally put together with somebody. Yeah, when you put together with another writer on the show, and that's fine. But but a lot of... Co- well, of course, if you're around a table in writing, it's highly collaborative. You're, you've got lots of people involved, and then stars get involved, and directors get involved, and so on. And the business itself is collaborative by nature. 100%. What makes collaboration work? Uh, listening. Listening. That's a I mean, one. I've been on shows where I really timed it. I've t- I once timed 34 minutes arguing over whether it should be the or a. <laughs> um... And it's subjective, you know, there's no, there's no right answer, but it's not a democracy. Sitcoms can't be a democracy. It's mm. gotta be the showrunner. And I, and there are a lot of showrunners who cannot make up their mind and they just want to listen to everybody endlessly and everybody pleads their case and goes back. And when the showrunner makes a decision and the other, somebody pleads their case again, the showrunner has to say, this is the line, let's try it. If it doesn't work, we'll write a new one. Right. Collab- a lot of collaboration has to be um, being willing to compromise and to give in to someone else at, on more than a few occasions. And people have given me shit because I do, I am, I love to compromise. If, if somebody, if, if I've been pitching a joke and somebody else has been pitching a joke, three people, and the showrunner says, this is the joke I want, I always say, yes, that's the perfect joke, let's move on. And even if it is against what I've done, and people have kidded me that, you know, they're going to name my production company Turn on a Dime Production. <laughs> but my, I want to just keep, them, keep it moving. Uh, again, I can't argue. I can argue if something is red or if it's blue. I know I, I can see colors. I can, I, I can argue if something is misspelled, you know? I can argue if somebody says the official language of France is German. I can have that argument but I cannot have an argument about which line is funnier. You're not saying that you, you can't have alternative facts, are you? Oh, I, you know, <laughs> and it's alternative jokes, and I believe in them, but if the showrunner says yes, I'll go yes. I will throw out my, you know, because I've sat in too many rooms till four, five, six in the morning. Oh, uh, so We could have gone home way earlier. Nothing is funnier at five in the morning. Well, I know exactly what you're talking about from working in academia because occasionally, because I've been teaching for about 10 years and, and occasionally you'll get into a committee of some kind and there will be a, an argument that will go on for 15, 20 minutes, sometimes a half hour over should it be the word is or are. And you're going, what are we talking about here? Just move, do it and move along. I know. I know. And you can always, and you know, somebody's going to prove it. And, and what I would do if I would volunteer to prove something, if I was running a show and I would say, I'll stay and prove it, then I put back whatever I wanted. But I don't want to have the whole room. Let's all agree on something. If it gets a big laugh in the room, I'm ready to move on unless somebody can tell me why I shouldn't. Can you tell in the room whether something's going to work on the stage or do you never know until they actually say it at table read? I'd say 80% of the time, you know. You know. you know, you know, listen, if everybody is laughing, but you can go to the table. It depends. You know, if an actor, an actor can tank it, mm-hmm. what's really humiliating, what's better, worse than an actor tanking it is having a bad line that, that, you know, you said, I think this will work. And then having a great actor deliver the shit out of it. And it mm-hmm. still falls like a turd in a splat on the ground and then you just go oh my god I'm so humiliated because that actor made it as good as it could ever be 
and prove to you that it was still a shitty line. Because sometimes actors don't like a line and they'll just go, meh, 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 meh. And you don't have it. You go, oh, I'm going to keep doing that line because the actor did it badly. So, all right, aside from, you know, you, at some point there's a script. It's not just a, a bunch of people babbling around a table. There's an actual right. script on paper or on a computer, wherever it is, but right. it's an actual script. It's an actual um, script. What is it that newer writers must think about and do when they're preparing their specs and their other scripts that they're going to try and present to people that beyond just getting script mechanics right, what is it they must do to, to secure a sale? What is important? Um, for a spec script, first of all, use the characters you have. Do not bring in another character. Mm -hmm. Do not say, I'm going to do a, 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 a spec broad city but I want I want to have a character of a, you know of a marine sergeant, and that's where the funny is going to be. No, you've got your characters. Write them. You know you don't need a funny uncle. Write the characters that you have and and make it believable. Because the chances, first of all, you don't write a spec for the show you want to be on. You know, so if you're looking for a job on Brooklyn Nine Nine, don't write a Brooklyn Nine Nine spec script. No, nope. because they. Because the people at Brooklyn Nine-Nine have written way better ones than you, I promise. And they've gone through it all. They've thought about it. So write it so that if you do write a Brooklyn Nine-Nine and you're trying to get a job on, I don't know, Young Sheldon, then if I'm reading it, I don't know Brooklyn Nine-Nine room that well. And so I go, oh, this is a, this is a terrific script. But if, it, it, it's, but if it's my characters, then I can find fault with it. Sure. You know? And so... Don't write to the show that you're, you're doing. The, the best spec, I, I, I've read some really great specs. One spec, when I was doing Gary Shandling's show, Ed Solomon, who has gone on to do Bill and Ted and Men in Black and, and it just is one of the best writers there is. His spec, this was before the whole Brady Bunch parody stuff came out. It was, Brady Bunch was still something in the past. He wrote a Brady Bunch spec script. And in it, <laughs> Alice the maid got accidentally beheaded by Sam the butcher, <laughs> but they still had the picnic. <laughs> and it was brilliant because it was, it was dead on. There was no winking to the audience. It was an absolute episode that could have happened except for the fact that Alice got beheaded. Oh my so, God. So that was a great spec. And then, and then back in the day when I was doing, um, Bette Midler's show, there was a, he, I've been doing, I did Bette's show. We did it. That was 2000, I think. So I've been working in television for more than for like 17 years or something. Right. I'd never worked with a black writer. That's interesting. And a woman named Meg Deloach, who is a wonderful writer and executive producer now has her own show. She wrote, because most black writers, their spec scripts were all, you know, for black shows, what were at the time the black shows. She wrote a Sex in the City. It was fantastic. And it was just a Sex in the City episode. So when she came in for her interview, because we flipped, we had no idea that she was a black woman. And that was great. And, and she, we had to hire her. It was an undeniable. Because, you know, people, they used to say, oh, we already have our our black writer. Or you know, they used to say, we one. already have our woman writer. We already have our women. And now they're saying we already have our white guy, <laughs> you know, which yeah. I'm fine with, but that's another story. Just write something. You, you don't have to put your, you know, it doesn't have to be about you. It doesn't have to be your personal story. It doesn't have to be autobiographical. But it's it better characters. But it damn well better be funny. It better be funny because most, you don't read the whole script. Nobody reads an entire spec really, un unless it's that great, you know, they're just. And so that means, that means that the, the, you really need to have a great first 10 pages. You better because, you know, I, I know a lot of people who, a lot of exec producers, first of all, they don't necessarily read somebody else's reading for them before they hand it to the exec producer. Right. So you better engage and make somebody laugh or somebody go, Oh my God, that's cool. Like, a Brady Bunch, you know, something to make people take notice and want to know more about that character. All right. But so let's move, let's move on to your theater experiences because you've done a little bit of all that too. Um, 
what is it about the theater? I mean, you started in the theater and you have a degree in the theater. Yes. Uh, what is it about the theater that has brought you back? It's surely not the money. No, right. Uh, no, it is not. The theater is, is volunteer work. I, um, I, I got the privilege of hitting one lotto in my life. I hit one lotto. And what did you hit? What was it? It's a show called Jekyll and Hyde that I created. Oh, right. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so that's a good lotto. Yeah. That's, a, that's the lotto. But, but that's so rare. You know? Oh, it's so rare. And, and what I, uh, I go back to the fact that when I was, I mean, you asked me the time I'm going to tell you how to make a watch, but when I was <laughs> eight years old, my parents, we lived in New Jersey, so it was easy to get to New York. My parents took me to the theater and I saw my first Broadway show, which was Flower Drum Song, Right. which is a good show, not a great show by any stretch of the imagination, but it was my first. And I remember sitting in that theater going, I had no idea I could feel this good. Mm. It wasn't just happy. It was satisfied. It was filled. It was, I, I was everything. I've never chased a job as much as I've chased that feeling. And so the theater was my way, was my gateway drug. And that's, and you know, when I graduated college, I worked at the Coconut Grove Playhouse in Florida. And then I worked at, Storyton, which was a theater in the round run by the world's oldest stripper, Ann Corio, who literally at her big strip, when she would take off her top, you would hear her go <gasps> and suck in her stomach so that her boobs would possibly rise up a little bit. Wow. But it was my gateway. And then when that stopped making me feel as full, then I went into publicity, I went into television, I went... I did a million different things, but it was always chasing that feeling. So that's what the theater was for me. It was just, and now whenever I can help somebody, you know, if I, if, if my friend David Lee was doing Can Can at the Pasadena Playhouse. Right. And he said, you want to come and pitch on it? Cause he knew I loved, and I went, sure. And I did my homework and I pitched a lot of stuff and some stuff you couldn't get in because you know, the estate and with theater, especially with a, 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 an existing theater piece, you know, you have a lot of well, it's copyright, it's copyright issues, right? There are issues and it's a, how far do you say to let you go? Um, hairspray, just cause I knew Mark Shaman. He said, you want to read this? And I just pitched, I just wrote down, maybe I pitched 40 jokes and maybe three got in. I don't know. Is the process of those of creating that work different than working on a sitcom or is it pretty similar? You're just, you're still coming up with set up joke, set up joke. And for the character and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to help the characters push the story forward. You don't want to ever stop for a joke. You know, you don't have time. That's a luxury, especially in a musical. You got to get to the next song. Um, so you well, just... Well, there's very little real estate in a musical for the dialogue or the book part of it. Exactly. I just finished one uh, uh, with my, these two wonderful guys in New York, and we were going to workshop it during COVID, but obviously, I mean, before COVID, but obviously we'll do it later. Right. But it was, you know, I would write, they would say to me, write as long as you can. Write this scene as full. And then they would take out easily three quarters of it some of it would end up in a song some of it would end up suggesting a song some would end up on the floor but but if i help move the story that's the job so so what you're really doing is you're writing the play on which they're then finally going to place songs or song spot as it's called right and they're going to hopefully further the character story via song although my thesis, you know, I've had this thesis for a long yeah. time. The songs and shows, the beauty part of songs and shows is um, that they can go internal where you can't actually express your internal thoughts as a character because it's, we only deal in sight and sound with scripts. Uh, but a song, you can actually internalize something and actually talk about the way you feel when you're not actually talking to someone. So that's wonderful that you put it, you're so articulate about that because I always, um, I'm driven crazy by stage directions and the actors hate stage directions. They totally hate them. They hate them because they say, he gives her a look that means I love you and I hate you. That means I want you and I don't want you. That means hello and goodbye. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, no. No, no, he's looking at her. <laughs> no. All it does is confuse an actor. It doesn't help. Well, them. and they get mad and then they cross everything out and throw it back in your face. So that's exactly. 
Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. All right. I want to. I want to also cover before we run out of time here, um, the Jackie Kennedy um, story. Oh wow! So, so when you were what age were you, were you when you wrote a letter to Jackie Kennedy? And I got to get the quote on here. Where is it? Oh, right. what I told her to do. Yeah. yeah well, you, I, you told her if you, to to sing show tunes when she was grieving over the death yeah. of President Kennedy. She was feeling a little blue. She <laughs> how how old were you? I was 13. I was old enough to know better. <laughs> I had, um, broke, I had, I, you know, I had polio, so my legs are not so great. And I had broken my hip and I was in a cast. And uh, during the Kennedy assassination, I was in the hospital as Kennedy was being assassinated. Right. And I came home and, and, and was watching all that stuff. And I loved them. I had their pictures, you know, I had loved the Kennedys as most kids did, but by about, December, when I saw she was still like looking sad, I said, I thought to myself, I, snap out of it, lady. I mean, it, I didn't say that to her, but I thought, come on. Sing show tunes. <laughs> per perk yourself up. So I wrote her and suggested that she sing, that she do, because I knew what she was going through because I was, you know, had my leg in a cast and mm -hmm. her husband's brains had been splattered across oh. her face, you know. Oh, how she didn't get on a, a, a Amtrak, go to Trenton, drive to my house, punch me in the face, <laughs> and then get back on the train and go back to DC. I'll never know. Anyway, so I told her to do that and it would perk her up. Um, and, I, and I even had the temerity to suggest that if she, whoever, I knew that she wasn't reading this letter, but her aides were reading the letter and they should, it would help them too. <laughs> so I, I was really, I was going all in. So nothing, nothing, nothing. And I got the, you know, you, she sent condolence, you know, a, official condolence card to everybody on, on St. Patrick's Day that year. And that was it. So now cut to uh, uh, 1993. Is that? No, no, 2003. That's 50 years. 2003. So it was like 2000. I get a phone call. No, no 2003 would have been 40 years. So 2013, thank you. You know, I see I had to go to a college where there was no math requirement. There you go. It still is in my life. So 2013. So I get a call. Uh, are you Janice Hirsch from Trenton, New Jersey? And I think, ugh, who did I go to Sunday school with who wants to meet Tom Cruise? But I say yes. <laughs> and it was Ellen Fitzpatrick, a historian, a noted historian, who was writing this book, Letters to Jackie. And she said, I'm going through the archives. And Mrs. Kennedy saved only a few of condo her condolence letters and yours was one of them. Wow, wow. And can we include it in this book? And I went, oh my God, of course, what? So she included it in the book and it was, you know, I only read that page of the book, but it was a very good book. <laughs> so then um, the, the, the director, Bill Court Courtier, who did um, the AIDS quilt film, right. a lot of wonderful documentaries. Then he called and said, I'm doing a documentary about it. Can we use your letter? I'm only gonna use like eight letters and I'm gonna have celebrities read them. And he had young Haley Steinfeld. Right. Steinfeld, Steinfeld yeah. Steinfeld, yeah. Yeah, she read, she read my letter. And then he, I sent him old home movies and whatever and pictures. And then I went, so I was included. And then I went on the dog and pony show because we, because he wanted, there were like two, one woman whose husband was in a submarine that exploded and Kennedy wrote the widow a condolence letter. And then three months later, Kennedy died. So the widow wrote Jackie a condolence letter. So she was there with this sad, sad story. Somebody else had written Jackie a condolence letter because she had been in the Holocaust and didn't believe in anything and then came to America and didn't believe and then Jack Kennedy and she believed. And then there was me. So I was like the comic relief. So these women would go and then, I, and then he died. Or one woman was like, I was a poor sharecropper, you know, daughter and I lived and my father was a slave and Kennedy. And then I go, I told her to sing from Dan Yankees. You gotta have heart. But I was, so I was the comic relief and we did we did, we were in Dallas. We did the Dallas Opera House on the 50th anniversary of his assassination. We were at the museum in DC and we did some other great 
place, which I don't remember where. Oh, the Kennedy Library uh-huh. in Boston. So we did those, you know, and and it was on CNN, and uh, it still lives on YouTube. But did yeah. you did you get laughs? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, 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 and, I did and, my job. I mean, I knew through, my job, so I got. And them. through all so, that, they needed the laughs. They needed. They the needed laughs. them. I was the, you know, we call it in in comedy writing. You need the treacle cutter. That, when you, you know, you always need a treacle cutter. You need I, something to cut through the sticky sweetness. If you've just done, you know, a uh, 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 scene, you know, what did we learn today, Michelle? You know, if you've done one of those things, I miss my dead, it's always the dead mother in comedy. So I miss my dead mother. And then you have somebody else come in and just go, hello, and do the comedy. Because you got to cut through the sticky sweetness. I, I've never heard the term treacle cutter before. That's treacle a good cutter. one. That's I, what you I, have to write. I like that term a whole lot. Um, yeah. All right, so we've been talking for almost an hour, believe it or not, and um, so we're going to wind this down a little bit. In all of your experiences, and goodness, you must have a bunch of different stories, but do you have a story um, that you can share that's either weird, offbeat, strange, quirky, or just plain funny? The story that I I think personifies how I've a- approached my career and I think that would help anybody approaching a career. When I first got to New York to work on the Lampoon, I had worked in Coconut Grove, Florida in the theater. Right. And the, one of the producers knew I was funny. I mean, I was the assistant manager. All I did is basically get his dry cleaning done, but he knew that I, I was funny. And he said, Will you, would you like to punch up? I have a Broadway show. Would you like to come and punch it up? And I went, oh my God, yes, send me the script. And he went, well, we don't have a script. And I thought, well, that could be part of the problem. <laughs> and I said, all right, well, I'll come to the show, you know, for the, for the next week or so, and I'll see it every night and I'll get jokes. He said, well, we open tomorrow. I went, <laughs> well, I'll come tonight. He said, good idea. So I get on the subway and I have my little legal pad and it's, it's called Play Me a Country Song. Okay. Mary Jo Catlett was the only actress, actor that I remember. Okay. And it was, I don't even know what it was about. And there were cowboys and men doing, you know, dances and all that stuff. And I wrote down a page of jokes, you know, as fast as I could hear them, I would write down a joke. That was it. And I went backstage and Jerry Adler, who I think played, what did he, on Mad About You, he was, um, he was like the super in the building. Well, he, and he was on The Sopranos as well. He was on The Sopranos, exactly. He was, yeah. He was, he was the next door neighbor, Dr. Hirsch or whatever his name Or no, yeah. he was, or Hershey or whatever his name was. Yeah, he was the Jew. Hesh. He was the Heshy. Jew. Heshy. He was the Jew. Uh, um, and he was the stage manager at the time. And so I gave Jerry, I knew him, and I gave Jerry my uh, handwritten, scribbled notes that I'd written in the dark. And he gave me a t-shirt from the show. That was my payment. Mm. And... It opened. The next day it opened. And so uh, the the morning after that, I, I mean, the reviews on television were disastrous. And the news, the, the reviews in the papers were, I'm telling you, wars have gotten better reviews. And Frank Rich called it a one joke musical. <laughs> and I thought, it was my joke. I got a rave review from Frank Rich. <laughs> and that has been, it is, first of all, I was laughing at myself. And secondly, it was like, I'm not going to take it so seriously. This show flopped. I wrote a joke for it. Somebody singles it out. I'm going to pretend it was my joke and have a good time. And I will, I will own being the butt of the joke as opposed to being the butt of the joke. Well, you know, that's... being part of a crappy show. I'm going to own it and say Look at me. You're, you were in show business. I knew exactly what in show business. It was that, sweeping up after the elephant. You were sweeping up after yes. the elephant. That's yep. exactly right. You, you know, what, what, how, how bad can it be? It wasn't like you were digging ditches, you know? No, exactly. I didn't hurt anybody. So, yeah. All right. So, last question for you, Janice. Do you have a solid piece of advice or a tip? Although we've heard many already through the show, but a really solid piece of advice or a tip for those who are trying to break in or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to get to the next level. I, I have two pieces of advice. First of Good. all, it's outline, 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 outline. No matter, I write, I start by writing a list of questions about every character. 
What do they, I, I, I will do, what do they want? What do they need? What do they think they need? What do they really need? I'll, you know, where do they live? Who are they friends? I'll just write a list of questions and then I'll go through and answer them. And then that's how I built and, and see what my outline is. And the other piece of advice I got for the first time two days ago. Okay. I, I was having uh, trouble. I'm writing, a, 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 working on a second book and I was having trouble. And my editor, said to me, and I just said, I just keep running into a wall. And she said, when couples go into sex counseling, because they're having trouble in their marriage, the sex therapist will say, take sex off the table and just cuddle. And then we'll talk later. And she said, that's what you have to do. So instead of trying to sit down and just write, I can take this time, and I can't be indulgent, but I can take this time to just think about character and think about where I'd like the story to go. I don't have to actually sit down at the computer and start banging stuff out. I can just keep making my notes and cuddling with the story until I have to start writing it. And I just got that two days ago. Well, that's, that's really interesting and very, very true. I mean, yeah. you, if you just let it percolate a little bit. Yeah. I mean, all those words, marinate, percolate, you can let yeah, it cro exactly. it's a crock pot. You can call it all those things. Yeah, but, exactly. But you need to get away from it sometimes. You have to have a little, you have to have a little perspective. Yeah. And it's hard when you're working alone and you're not in a room and you're not, you're not, you don't have other, you know, I could, I once cleaned my fireplace because I didn't want to write. You know, I can distract myself easily, but I wanted to write. I wanted, but I didn't, I didn't have the ability. Well, you you also have been uh, gloriously spoiled by so many years of working with all those people around a table. I'm the president of the fucking lucky club. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Janice Hirsch, this has been an absolutely sp spectacular um, hour on Story Beat today. Uh, I I'm just I'm delighted that you came on the show, and it's just been so much fun. So I I, I thank you kindly for being on with me. Thank you so much for letting me talk about myself for an hour. Thank you. <laughs> well, I can't think of anyone I'd rather hear about, so that's really great. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this podcast, please take a moment to give us a rating or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.